Welcome once again to the official MUFON podcast. I am your host, Richard Beckwith. It would be an understatement to refer to my next guest as a legend in UFO research. Grant Cameron became involved in ufology in May of 1975 with his personal sighting of what could only be referred to as a UFO. Over the next 18 months, he had many sightings of both large and small objects. He spent countless days photographing strange objects and interviewing hundreds of witnesses. After composing a manuscript about the flap, he moved his attention to research the work of the late Wilbert Smith. Smith headed up the Canadian government flying saucer investigation known as Project Magnet, which ran from 1950 to 1954. During two decades of work on Smith, Cameron was able to collect most of Smith's files and materials. He interviewed most of the associates around Smith who worked on the flying saucer investigation. Years of Smith research led to the discovery of former Penn State University President Dr. Eric Walker, who was identified by Dr. Robert Sarbacher as a key person inside the UFO cover-up. Cameron teamed up with T. Scott Crane to research and write a book titled UFOs, MJ-12, and the Government, published by the Mutual UFO Network. The book summed up three years of research on Dr. Walker's involvement. Grant is best known for his work regarding presidents and their knowledge of UFOs. After a lifetime of research on this subject, however, Grant's thinking regarding the UFO-UAP issue has evolved from what one might call a nuts-and-bolts perspective to a more esoteric facet of the phenomenon. I am more than honored to have him here tonight as my guest, Grant Cameron. Welcome to the MUFON podcast. Thank you, Richard, for having me on. I appreciate your interest in what I'm doing. I, I am very interested in what you're doing. I know that, as we discussed just before the program started, that you had done a lot of work with regard to presidents and UFOs, what presidents yep. knew and when they knew it, um, and which presidents knew what. Uh, yep. But but you don't do that anymore. And 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 there's a reason for that because you've you've sort of gone down a bit of a rabbit hole, if I if I may. And yep. and and I, I I I guess I have gone down a bit of a rabbit hole myself. And I yep. want to see if we're going down the same rabbit hole. <laughs> Maybe. Let's see. <laughs> so um, you've talked about the rabbit hole. I want you to tell me what the rabbit hole is. I've been down a number of rabbit holes. I've um, none of the stuff I, as a looking back and you can always see the patterns when you look back. None of the stuff that I did, I intended to do. I had no intention of seeing a UFO in 1975. Um, I got dragged into that. Um, then I, um, when I saw, I guess I should sort of hi highlight what happened there. I, I had a sighting um, because there was a, a town called Carmen, Manitoba, which is just north of the U.S. border, just north of North Dakota. I live in Canada. And there was a small town was having sightings of a thing called Charlie Red Star. And I had no interest in UFOs. I had interest in sort of paranormal stuff. I was interested in Edgar Casey and stuff like that. No interest in UFOs. Never thought about it. Never thought about extraterrestrial life. And we used to drive around the city. And so my friend said, they're seeing this thing. Isn't this pretty cool? Because it was all over the newspapers where I was. The only reason we went out was because um, I, I said, well, you know, it's like we buy the lottery ticket. And we, we'll go out there. We won't see anything, but we, let's go and see whatever he's looking at. We didn't go out for three months. And then the local TV station caught this thing on camera. And this is in a documentary called UFOs that has begun by uh, Bob Emenegger. It used to be UFOs past, present, future was done in 1975, 1979. Jacques Vallée was uh, on the thing. Jacques Vallée narrates a video that was taken. Uh, they got this thing on the ground in Carmen, Manitoba. And the cameraman caught it as it jumped off the ground and went flying across the sky. And it was at that point I said to my friend, come on, let's, let's go see what they're looking at. I mean, and so we went out there. And we didn't see anything for an hour. We're driving around and I don't know what we're looking at or what we're supposed to be looking at and uh, whatever he's describing, whatever. And uh, my friend said, okay, let's, let's go into the town one more time. If we don't see anything, let's go home. So I said, okay, that's fine with me. This has been a total waste of time. Uh, we turned the car to go, we're about a mile um, east of the town. We turned to go back into town and the thing flew. It wasn't a late in the sky. It was an object. It flew right in front of the car. And I just went, whoa, it's like, oh my, like, yeah, I was just, I was floored. I, I just fell off the edge of the earth. I've always described it that way. 
And um, I couldn't get enough. Um, I watched this thing. It looked like a, it was a plasma object, very red, pulsing, very low to the ground, maybe a couple hundred feet up. It was bobbing up and down. It wasn't flying in a straight line. And so I dragged all my friends out there two nights later, and they left after an hour and said, now nah, we're going back. This is a waste of time, whatever. Second night, the thing came right at us. And the second night, it, it was coming really low to the deck. It was maybe, again, a couple hundred feet up. It was jumping around the sky. It started as one object and turned into another object. So it was what was some kids, young kids that I interviewed there called the, the bouncing ping pong ball. It was like a light flashing around the sky. It was jumping all over the sky. The one girl that was there, she was crying. She couldn't see it because it was jumping all over the place. And um, again, I'm just like floored by this thing. And it came right at us. And it turned in, it, as it came closer, it turned back into this red pulsing object that I'd seen the first night, moving very, very slow, maybe 30, 40 miles an hour, very, very slow. And um, then it made this sort of left-hand turn and it sort of just flew off into the north. And years later, I suddenly realized the importance of that because uh, at that time I said, wow, I mean, that, that's ex that could be extraterrestrial uh, planet. Because there was, there was no doubt this was nothing that, I, that, that anybody had ever seen. My father was a pilot. My son's a pilot. I'm not stupid. And, and, and yet when it was flying away, I looked at it and I go, what's it doing? And that was the thing that stuck with me and, and sort of affected my whole life. It was because it wasn't doing anything. It was just flying along. And la later I would go to like, why did, why did I see the thing? Why did I fall off the edge of the earth? Nobody else had any sort of reaction to it. And it was almost like if they hadn't got that thing on camera on jumping up. I never would have gone out there because I had no interest. So what I had done was I, I was, I was sort of like in down the rabbit hole and I went and I interviewed all these people in the town and at that time, like abductions, Travis had only would be abducted later in that year, November of that year. 1975. There, really no abductions. there was nothing like that. It was basically just landing trace cases, which haven't happened for 25 years. Uh, there was a lot of weird UFO sightings, uh, objects where somebody would throw a stone at the thing in the water. It would break into five pieces and the pieces would sort of go back together and fly up into this object and the fly, object would fly away. Really weird sort of stuff. I gathered all the sightings together. I put them in a manuscript, which, which would, would be published maybe four or five years ago. But at that time, nobody wanted to publish it. And the local publisher said, Mr. Cameron, you may believe in this kind of stuff. Count me among the unbelievers. And I went, whoa. I just, I thought, <laughs> I'd say, I, you know, I'd, I'd solved the problem. I'm going to make a million copies and I'm going to be rich. And I've solved this thing. And, and they couldn't care less. And, and so then all I said was, you know, I, I was, remembered this thing flying away the second night. And I said, I don't know what's going on, but somebody's got to know what's going on here. I'm, I'm just this young guy from Canada, uh, you know, no uh, background in anything. And I said, somebody's got to know. So that's why I started this pursuit. So I went after the Canadian government first. I went after um, I, uh, synchronicity. You get these synchronicities. A guy who worked in my father's office at the Department of Transport uh, was a radar tech guy who had worked on the Canadian government UFO program. And he was just a, a junior engineer who was changing tapes and they had, they had a flying saucer observatory outside the, the nation's capital in 1954. And that's why they shut the program down because they detected this flying saucer over top of this, this thing. They had been in contact with this, with this alien by the name of AFA and they'd asked AFA to fly over on August the 1st, August the 8th, he flies over and um, they go running out. The, all the detectors go off and the bells are going off. So this guy was in my father's office, happened to be there when these bells went off. And he said, you know, if you really want to know what's going on with UFOs, you should study what the Canadian government was doing. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, oh, it was this Wilbur Smith guy. He was the smartest engineer I ever met. And, and he ran the Canadian government flying saucer program. And he was, uh, he was the smartest engineer, but he was totally crazy. He was talking to the aliens and they were landing in his backyard. And I said, they were what? <laughs> I was like, Holy cow. Oh so gosh. down this rabbit hole, I go and I, I go and interview his wife. Wilbur Smith had died by then. I went and interviewed his wife and his wife's talking about this alien like it, like it was the family pet. And I was just like, I was floored. So I studied that for quite a while. And, and the, the, Wilbur Smith was famous for writing a very famous document. The, it's called the Top Secret Memo. Yes. It's one of the few legitimate top secret memos in the UFO field. And that's the one where he says, I go to the Americans because he ran what was called Radio Ottawa in Canada. And that was like NSA. He was the, the chief radio engineer for the Canadian government. And of course, he was using radio transmitters to pick up Russian communications. And they, they told me that he was running Radio Ottawa. They said, you realize how high security clearance was. So he went down to the United States on, he was uh, negotiating FM radio frequencies at the time with the Americans as to who gets what frequencies. And he had all the, all the communications for the intelligence. He was in charge of everything. And he went down and he started asking questions. So in this top secret memo, he said, I went down and I asked American officials. So he's not talking to people on the street. I've talked to American officials. They're going through the Canadian embassy. We've actually got the correspondence that went through the Canadian embassy. 
And the Americans are basically waiting. And it sounded like the Canes thought the Americans were going to make a statement that they had a crash flying saucer. And um, so Wilbur said, I, I went down there and I was told the following items. Number one, flying saucers exist. Number two, it's the, it's, uh, uh, flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. Number three, there's a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush who are trying to figure out what's going on. And number four, it's of tremendous significance to the Americans. And then what would not occur to me until 2012 is the next line in the document that where Wilbur just says, and we're also told by American officials that other things might be associated with the flying saucers, such as mental phenomena. And the Americans aren't doing very well because they said if we're working on it, they're willing to exchange credentials and talk to us. And the th key to that was that nobody had talked to an alien until 1952. Until we detonated the first hydrogen bomb in November of 1952, that's when Adamski had his experience in the desert, where suddenly the aliens come and they say, oh, we went to stop the nuclear tests and stuff. So in 1950, the question was, how did the Americans know to tell the Canadians that mental phenomena is involved because nobody knew. Like now we have these ideas that there was a live alien at Roswell and it was talking in people's heads and stuff like that, but we didn't know then. So uh, what I had done then was sort of ran out of leads with the Canadians and what do we wanted to, do to find out? And Stanton Friedman was working on it. I was working on it. There was a guy by the name of Arthur Bray who was a researcher in Ottawa. And we were all trying to figure out, well, who was Wilbur talking to in the United States? He was getting this material and it seemed like it was, and that's, if you remember the MUFON conference in Toronto in 1982, um, Arthur Bray, who was, had the files at the time, Wilbur Smith had hidden all his files when he died. He told his wife, they're going to try to get my files, hide the files. So these files were hidden for a number of years. And then Arthur Bray got him in the 1970s. And he's the one that discovered the top secret memo, the draft of the top secret memo, which was in Smith's files. And then he and Stanton Friedman forced the Canadian government to declassify, and we found it in the declassified Department of Transport files. So anyway, we were down there, and that's when we just, the, in Wilbur Smith's files, it was discovered that there's this guy by the name of Dr. Robert Sarbacher, who was a uh, yes. uh, advisor in Washington, ran the Washington Institute, and he would work for different agencies, like, uh, you know, the military agencies, and he was like a, like a, a you know, come to him with scientific questions and stuff, and he would work on all this kind of stuff, and he had said that in 1950, he had, um, he had been invited to a series of briefings at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that they'd had a crash, and that a bunch of people like Von Braun, Von Neumann, uh, Vannevar Bush, him, a bunch of people had been invited to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to be briefed on, on what they discovered. And he said, I couldn't go. He was working on the Dew Line in Canada, running a bunch of engineers. He said, I couldn't go. So Stan does an interview in 1983 with Robert Sarbacher, and he says to him, he says, well, so who was there? I mean, who you're naming all these dead guys, like Von Braun and Von <laughs> Newman and all these guys. Is there anybody that still might be alive? And he said, well, there's this one guy from Pennsylvania, and he, he was a real arrogant guy. He thought he knew everything. He had a company like me. And uh, a guy by the name of William Steinman, who was a researcher in, in California, tracked it down to be Dr. Eric Walker, who was the former president of Penn State University, co-developer of the homing torpedo, chairman of the board of the Institute for Defense Analysis, which is the top <laughs> military think tank in the United States, wow. 14 honorary doctorate degrees. Uh, and so we went after him. So that was the next rabbit hole. We go after him. And I sort of led a, a, a group of uh, researchers who went after Walker. And I, I, I don't like doing interviews. So all these people do interviews and I would say, okay, here's Walker. Uh, you can get him to talk. Okay, here's his. And people would contact him. And Walker would do rhymes and riddles. He would sort of, you know, tell you, but, you know, say, leave it alone. There's nothing you can do about it. He was asked about MJ-12. I've known of them for 40 years. Leave it alone. There's nothing you can do. You're up against the windmills. You're wasting your time. Unless you've got that mind of Einstein, you're, you're totally wasting your time. Leave it alone. Go study something else. He would say stuff like this. So we spent a, a number of years. And then MUFON published, the first book MUFON ever published was the book Walt Andrews published it. And that was the book on Dr. Eric Walker. So we did all the stuff, all the interviews that have been done with Walker. And we put them in a book. We put it out and Walker continued to talk after that. And um, so then he died and I went to, we knew he had a file because he would send to one researcher, he would photocopy a file and make some snide comment on, on the questions and send it to another researcher. So we knew he had a file on us. He was keeping a file on all these different researchers that were trying to talk to him. And um, so he at one point talked about at the Truman Library that he was going to leave his files. And we, what we were looking for is the files that he had as the executive director of the Research and Development Board. So Vannevar Bush had run the Research and Development Board, which was the weapons in the U.S. Defense Department. And that was all the nuclear bombs and stuff like that. And they had learned that all this technology was being developed through all this kind of stuff. So after the war, they had this joint research and development board that continued on. And Walker was the executive director. So he was the second in command. And he was going to leave those files at the Truman Library. 
And, and so we went, I went to the Truman library after Walker. First I went to Penn state and I looked through Walker's files, hundreds of thousands of pages of stuff. I couldn't find them looking for this UFO file. I couldn't find it. So I thought, well, maybe it's a Truman library. So I went to the Truman library and that's when the president thing started. So I go there and then I, I, there's really nothing on Walker. There's a couple of things, but nothing related. And um, so I said, um, that's when I said, well, the president's the most powerful guy in the world. He's a smart guy. He's got to know what's going on here. So I said to the archivist, I said, so what do you got on UFOs? And he says, oh, well, and he, he, they look and, he, and he says, well, we've got all the telegrams. If you remember 1952, the overflight of Washington, D.C., yep. uh, Truman gives the shoot down order and it's on the newspaper. And then the week later, the thing flies over the Saturday night later, it flies over. But between those two times, everybody's sending all these telegrams into the White House. Mr. President, don't shoot down the UFOs. Don't shoot them down. And, and all these, they had all these telegrams of people saying, don't shoot down the UFOs. And so there was nothing there. And I'm thinking, that's, that's kind of weird. There's the, you think the, the, the Roswell, all these crashes and the stuff would be there. So the uh, Eisenhower Library is just down the road, maybe a couple hours down the road in Abilene, Kansas. So I said, well, I'll go to the Eisenhower Library. And that's when I sort of really went down the rabbit hole. I, I talked to the archivist and the, the Eisenhower Library is very sort of um, formal, very conservative. Everybody's, you know, all the archivists are wearing suits and stuff like that. And you have to do an, uh, an oral uh, interview to go in there and they want to know why you're researching and, and they, they, they won't let you in unless you do the, this interview. So I go in there and I say, I'm looking for UFOs and, and what the, the Eisenhower knew and stuff like that. And they only had five documents. One was the famous um, Robertson panel report. It had been done under the Truman administration at the very end of the Truman administration, but the document itself is in the Eisenhower library because it was right at the end of the administration. So that document was there and there was a telegram from one of the contactees of the 1950s and stuff like that. But there was only five documents. And I said, there's five documents. I said, well, how many pages have you got in the library? He said, 28 million. I go, something's wrong here. Something's wrong. Like, they want five documents. And I'm going like, what's going on? So then that's when I started the search. And I went from library to library to library and I went all over the place. And I found a lot of stuff like at the Clinton Library and the, the Carter was very interested. And there was actually an archivist at the Carter Library who was very interested. He had talked to Chip Carter and he had actually said that the date is wrong. We used the date of 1969, I think. He said it was earlier because he went to high school with Chip Carter. And he said, it, he Chip told me that story. It was before 1969. So he, we'd be sitting there talking UFOs and he would actually send me stuff that you know he'd found as an archivist. So I went, I did this whole pursuit and I went, I went through all the different libraries and I sort of came to the conclusion that the president would know. I, I firmly believe the president has a, um, especially if he wants to know, he can find out what, 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 what's going on. And yet the president is not going to tell you. So I was, it was 2012 and that's when I really got on this separate rabbit hole where I'm, I'm sort of spinning my wheels and I'm, you know, I'm sort of the guy that does the president stuff and everybody wants to hear the stories about Reagan sightings and his contact and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of weird stories about different presidents and what they'd said about UFOs and the documents and the libraries and stuff. And I'm at a lecture in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, that's where Colin Andrews is giving this lecture on consciousness and crop circles. And it, it, the, I'm, I don't want to go in the lecture it's like the UFO thing in 75. I had no interest in crop circles. And yet I knew there was a big controversy. Colin Andrews had come out and said that tw only 20% of crop circles were real. The others were hoaxed. And there was this big controversy. Everybody wanted to hang them, you know, and well, stuff like that. Can I ask you this, Grant? At, yeah. at this point, were, were you still a, a nuts and bolts UFO person? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I said in 2012, this is where the consciousness thing comes. I said in 2012, I couldn't have spelled consciousness and I couldn't have cared less. So uh, he's talking about consciousness and crop circles and the theory that he was proposing at this 2012 lecture, which was February 26th, uh, he said um, the 80%, 20% are real and the other 80% are hoaxed. And they had given, got, got money from Lawrence Rockefeller and they had uh, investigators who tracked all these hoaxers down that were doing these crop circles. And he had interviewed these, these guys with the, with the hoax crop circles and that he'd come to the determination that they were also being told that the, the guy would be sitting in his living room and he'd say, you know, I think I should put this, uh, I, I got this design. I should go put this design. And he would go into a field to put this crop circle design down. And there would be women in the field meditating the same crop circle that they wanted this crop circle. And it would appear in the field. These guys would hoax the crop circle. So he was saying the, the, the intelligence was doing all the crop circles. They were telling the hoaxers what to put down. And they were also doing these other crop circles. So when I'm in the lecture, I'm sort of zoning out. And I wrote a book called Contact Modalities, where I talk about this, this concept that Ray Hernandez from Free came up. Uh, this idea that everything is, is consciousness and we're parsing it. And all the paranormal phenomena are the same thing. They're all linked by consciousness. And so um, I'm sitting there and that's when 
I'm zoning out, which is the one that I use the most is, is uh, you sort of, you shut down your left brain, you're, you're not really thinking. And then suddenly it came into my head and there was three things that came into my head. And the one I've already mentioned, that was this 1950, um, uh, top secret memo and i had talked about the top secret but i'd always talked about the first four points flying saucers exist it's the most highly class such the part about the, the mental phenomena i had never really mentioned in lectures and that came into my head and then i go oh that's what they're talking about it's consciousness and the second thing that came into my head and this all came instantaneously all three things it was like they took three pieces of a puzzle put them in my head and it's like oh it's sudden it was it was what called noetic material it's like you're talking to god it's like you got you got a download it comes with with knowledge like william james who developed psychology in the united states you tapped Americans. into the akashic record yeah it's like it's there and it it just sticks it together and the second thing that happened the second thing that came in was dr eric walker and we'd done a number of interviews with him and at one point he's being interviewed by a guy from great britain and this is 1991 and this is the second thing that came out of my head he says to walker he says okay what about mj12 is it all still just american guys and is there still just 12 people and walker said look let me ask you a question but you know about esp and and the guy goes i don't know and walker says look Unless you understand about ESP and how it works, you will not be taken in by the control group. Very few people understand how it works. So that was the second piece of the puzzle. Walker's talking about this ESP thing. And then the third was Jan Harzen, who goes to see the lecture at UCLA with Ben Rich in 1993. This is two years later. And he has the experience at nine years old with the UFO in the backyard. And he, him and his brother want to build a flying saucer, becomes an electric, electrical engineer. He's fascinated with propulsion. And Ben says, we've got the technology to take ET home. We've discovered the mistake in the equation. And as he's going out the door, Ben uh, Jan races after me, says, look, I've been interested in UFOs my whole life. I need to know, how do they get here? How does the propulsion system works? And Ben turns around and this is exactly what walker said two years later he said let me ask you a question well you know about esp and jan says uh well it means everything in time and space is connected he said that's how it works walks out of the building and takes off so in 2012 it this three pieces came in and i go that when i saw that thing flying away the second night and i said what's going on what what's really this is all about it was like the answer came and said this is what it is consciousness so then I started to do lectures on consciousness and a lot of people cut me loose in the UFO community. It's like Cameron's lost his mind. Uh, I remember, if you remember uh, Jerry Pippen, very good friend of mine, Jerry Pippen used to do a lot of interviews back in, in the day. He was one of the big interviewers, had a, a, a show. And he said to me, he said, Grant, I can't believe you've done this. I, I just can't believe you've done this. You, you had the president stuff. You were the president guy. I mean, you went this. I mean, I, I can't believe you've done it. And I said to him, Jerry, I'll tell you what, Jerry. I, I didn't choose to do this. I sort of got teleported there. And that was the thing. It was like, it, 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 I didn't plan this. And so I started giving these lectures and then I had a, a, a dramatic experience that sort of confirmed it. In 2013, I'm giving a lecture in Phoenix again. And it's my sort of my, one of my first consciousness lecture theories uh, where I'm doing the consciousness thing. And at the end, Stacy uh, Wright, if you know, for, runs the MUFON group in Phoenix says to me, she says, are you still going to talk to Pam Dupuy? And I said, yeah, I guess so. And I think, oh, I must have agreed to talk to this woman. And they said, that's good. She's coming to the house on Monday. You can talk to her. So this Pam Dupuis, she's in her 70s. She comes to the house on the Monday. And she says, oh, uh, what did Stacy tell you about me? I said, I don't know. She just said, I'm supposed to talk to you. So that's good. Comes walking in with her with her, her partner. And they sit down and she starts talking. And, you know, I'm an abductee and I remote view. And she's going on about all this stuff. And you hear all this stuff. And I'm going, whatever, you know, and she's talking away. And then she says to me, she says, Oh, and last night I was flying the flying saucer. And I went, what? <laughs> I was ready to, I was ready to throw her out of the house. Like I've heard, okay, that's, that's, you've gone too far. You're, you're coloring outside the lines now. And, and, and I said, you're flying the flying saucer. I said, they let you fly the flying saucer. And she said, oh yeah, yes, I've, I've thrown three different models. And I'm thinking to myself, like Arab women at that time, were not allowed to drive a car unless there's a man in the car and stuff. And I go, <laughs> it, it let a woman, 70 years old, fly the flying saucer. Yeah, I've thrown three different models. And I and so then what are you going to say? I said, so how do you fly to flying saucer? She says, oh, you do it with your mind. And then I realized why they got me to talk. And I now have 50 people who have flown the flying saucer. And I've got a guy out of LA, uh, a U.S. Air Force colonel, who um, I talked to him about it. And I've got a 747 United Airlines pilot out of San Francisco. I've got 50 people, most of them women, uh, that when, or like Chris Bledsoe. And so Chris told me, he's flown the flying saucer. I said, you flown the flying saucer? Stop. I want, I'm going to phone you on Skype. I want you to start from the beginning, go to the end. I want you to tell me the story. And everybody, it's like they're reading off a cue card. 
how do you fly a flying saucer? They say, I go, I go into the craft. There's somebody behind me. I don't know if it's humans or it's, or it's, it's beings behind me. And I'm standing in the middle of the craft and they, they say, okay, go ahead and do it. And like the seven for uh, the, the air force colonel guy says, he says, I don't know what to do. And they said, you know what to do. Just go do it. And then he says, there's a panel there. And he goes and puts his hands on the panel. And every says the same thing. They put their hands on a panel. They put their hand on a ball or they put their hand on a panel on the wall. They become one with the craft. The craft is alive. Everybody says the same thing. It's conscious. And that the craft is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Like Terry Lovelace says, there's a bunch of people who said this. And, and nothing really makes sense. Or that once you put your hand on the panel, you can see in 360 degrees, which makes no sense whatsoever. But they all say the same thing. And then the, like this, the Air Force guy, because he's he, when I, I talked to him, he said, they, they, they told me, he said, Robert, talk to Grant. You tell me your story. And he said, I, I, I think it's a dream. I said, everybody thinks it's a dream. So tell me your story. And so he told me his story. He puts his hands on the panel and he says, suddenly, he says, it's like suction cups on an F-16, whatever that is. And he says, I'm there and I'm flying the craft. He says, it's flying. And then he's, 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 he's so amazed. And then he takes his hand off the panel and he's waiting for the thing to stall out. And then nothing stalls out. And then he, he takes his other hand off the panel, but he keeps it a, a couple inches off in case it stalls. He's going to put his hand back on the panel again. And he says, takes his hand off the panel. He's got no hands on the panel and whatever he thinks is what the craft does. And everybody says the same thing. And that sort of confirmed to me, there's this consciousness connection to, to this whole uh, UFO thing. Okay. So, so hang on, hang on a second there, Grant. So this, this, uh, this makes me think about, about Bob Lazar. And it makes me think about uh, the trip that they took out there were the several trips that they took out and videotaped this object and also Bob's recollection of the object that he worked on being, uh, uh, being operated somehow, but he had no idea how it was being operated. He also had no idea how he was, how they were able to communicate with the craft because of the way radio works and so forth. So uh, is it, is it possible in that, in that context that that, that was exactly what was taking place that, that this object was being, uh, that, that he was seeing could perhaps have been controlled by by thought and, and, and also taking into consideration his recollection of the interior of the craft, which didn't have any any sort of uh, control knobs or buttons or sticks like you would imagine something like that. that everything was smooth. Is that is that is that reasonable? Yeah, except that what I would, because I, in one of my books, I, I did the, the Bob Lazar thing. I did a, a huge section because I was around when Bob Lazar was doing it. I was actually in contact with George Knapp and people. And one of the things I always point out to people that Bob Lazar was only on the base about six times. That's why his, his W-2 form or whatever it was only had $900 on it. Because he was, that's why he took out Lazar. That's why he took Bob uh, Lear and uh, Huff and all these guys out to see the test. It's because he was so frustrated. He wasn't being allowed on the base. He, w- he was only being there a couple of times. So he would have limited knowledge. But he did talk about that, this idea that, you know, there's this consciousness thing. But you see it going back even to bizarre things that pop out. Like uh, if you, if you're, you know, music of the day, uh, Cat Stevens, who became a Muslim and then didn't sing anymore. He was very famous in the 1970s. He definitely talks about being taken off a roof in London before he became a Muslim when he was talking about it. And he said, I know, I know I was taken. I know I was taken. He writes two songs. One was called about his abduction experience. One was called Longer Boats. One was called Freezing Steel. He said, I was on the ship, the ship of freezing steel, the ship without the guiding wheel. That was like 1972. He wrote that song, mm-hmm. and nobody knows. But that's the that's the whole key, uh, is that uh, the people that that describe it uh, all are basically describing the same thing. Especially this thing, the the craft, the craft being alive, or the story. I remember I used to think that the story of the the guy at Area 51. He was um, uh, an engineer guy that built rockets at 11 years old or whatever. The Lemay, I can't remember the guy's name. But he tells a story about uh, being taken to, they want him to launch this rocket to Area 51 and the, it's there. And then they take him, they say, come and look at this thing. And he has this engine. There's a, they have this huge engine underground at Area 51 and he puts his hand on it and, and it starts to make patterns and he realizes the engine is alive. And he said, what did you do to this thing? It has a hole in it or whatever. And uh, I used to think that ho- that story was a hoax. I thought that was absolutely insane. And then years later, after I heard these stories about the flying the craft, I'm going, maybe this is real because that's what he was describing is that the engine was alive. And that, and uh, so that that's the, the, where we went with this thing. And the more I looked at it, the more you get um, situations where you realize that it, 
as I say, it's going to be a lot less physical than people think it is. It's going to be a lot more spiritual than people think it is. It's going to be a thousand times more complex than people uh, think it is. And uh, you, you get over and over again this, this idea that um, we have an idea. Or for example, um, if you hear the story of um, um, Tom DeLong, Tom DeLong goes to Lockheed Skunk Works. He goes to this barbecue thing, and they say, we want you to introduce the president of Lockheed Skunk Works. And then they say, okay, if I get five minutes with a guy, I'll, I'll introduce him, whatever. And he gets to go on to Area 51. He's in this skiff, and he's talking to the head, head scientist and this other guy before Robert Weiss, the head of Lockheed, comes out, out of the room to see him. And he's talking to the head scientist. The head scientist says, so, how does it work? And he says, well, you know, I, and well, that's pretty good idea. What else? What do, what do you, what do you think? I just want to know how does it work? And then he had hung around with, a lot of people don't know that, that um, Tom DeLong hung around with Stephen Greer. That's how he started through Stephen Greer. And Stephen Greer was into the consciousness thing. And so he said, oh, I think consciousness is involved. And that's when Tom DeLong says, the head scientist said, now you're talking. And for 45 minutes, the head scientist at Lockheed Skunk Works, that's all he wanted to talk about was consciousness. Let me ask and you this. The, let me ask you this, Grant. Yeah. What, what, is this, what does this say about uh, the future or, or about these other civilizations, these other intelligences, if, if you will? Uh, what can we say about them if they are able to imbue a technology, an apparent technology, with consciousness? Because I've, I've heard this myself, that, that the objects that people come into contact are themselves alive and conscious. So what does it say when we, when we are able to imbue a, a piece of technology with, with that uh, ineffable quality? Well, what it, what it, where I went from that is to look at the idea of um, the way it was described to me through my noetic experiences is that we, we build the world as if, we've got all the pieces, all the blocks, and we're just missing one block. And if we get that one block, we'll figure it all out. The way it was described to me is you've got all the wrong blocks. You, you think all the blocks you've got are right. And so the idea, the concept is like in 1492, we thought the world was flat. We thought this the sun went around the earth. We thought things were solid. We thought we were at the center of the universe. We thought that there was only 5,000 stars. Wrong block, wrong block, wrong block. We've got all the wrong blocks. Or as Einstein said, uh, you cannot solve a problem using the same information that you use to create the problem. Any paranormal event simply means one thing. You got something wrong. Something you believe is not right. And, and, and it's giving you an indication if you can figure out what that thing is. So what it is, is that we're, that I think the main mistake we make is that we believe that nuts and bolts is primary. Whereas majority of the quantum physicists, if you look at the beginning, Max Planck and guys said that nothing gets behind consciousness. Consciousness is primary. Consciousness creates matter. And that's something that it's going to take us a while to get around because it's so obvious that it, like the world is flat. The sun goes around the earth. Things are solid. There's time and space. There's a physical world. And this concept that you can go through walls, that's why people defy this. You can't go through walls. You can't get there from here because time and space prevent them. And, and the, the idea, you go to quantum physicists like, um, um, what's his name? Um, the guy that came up with black holes and wormholes. Um, oh, oh Stephen name. Hawking. No, no. Um, John Wheeler. Oh, okay. So John yeah. Wheeler won the Nobel Prize. He came up with this. He said, there's no out there, out there. Now, if you actually understand the concept of that, there is no out there, out there. And that's this concept that it's all within yourself, that the out-of-body experience, you're not going out of your body, you're going into your body. Or if you get into the real weird stuff, like Deepak Chopra says, everything is an action inside consciousness. It's this idea that consciousness is primary and that, that that's the mistake we're making. So we're using these wrong blocks. We assume all the, the blocks are right. Or the, the idea of Einstein, you know, that you're, you're using the wrong blocks, you're shuffling them around, and you're never going to get it because you've got all the wrong blocks. Or uh, William James said, you think you're thinking, you're just rearranging your prejudices. That's the problem we have is that we're assuming that a lot of stuff that we have is right. But that's what the paranormal teaches us is that something is wrong. So when they're going through a wall, when they take you through a wall, you got to say, what is really going on? Take a closer look. What's really going on here? Is it what we think it is? Because if, you, if it's a physical world, you can't do this kind of stuff. It's sort of indicating, and, and I can give you an example of shows uh, what, what that may be. There's an experiencer who I'm encouraging to write his book. He's got a real bad heart condition. I keep saying, finish your book, Ron. He's a, he's a Mormon guy out of uh, um, 
uh, Utah, who's had a lot of experiences. He's journaled everything for 50 years. He's got this massive journal of all this sort of stuff. And he describes his experiences, some as being very physical abduction experiences, some, but most of them as out-of-body experiences. And he has a being he calls LB. And LB takes him into the spirit world. And he's with his dead mother in the spirit world. So he's, he says, I'm there. And there's this sort of temple thing. And my mother says, when you die, Ron, you're going to come here. You're going to have a room in this building. And he sees his father in this building and stuff like this. And uh, LB, the being is with him. And then he says, you know, and I go there and he says, we go in the building and it's 10 times the size inside the building as it is outside. And I said, Hey, that's what the UFO people say. That's exactly what Chris Bledsoe says. That's what Terry Lovelace says. Terry Lovelace said it was a normal size. He went inside. It was a size of a football stadium inside. And that's the thing is, so what are we really looking at here? Are we looking at a physical world or are we looking at something else where they're let less physical? And in the end, I can go to the end and then you can go back to questions. But in the end, I think when I look at what do they really know, I don't think that they know what they you think they know, but there's things they know that we don't really believe. So what it comes down to is you get guys like Hal put off with talk about the zero point energy and all this kind of stuff. And uh, one of the things I do is I follow the highest level people. That's when I started. I said, somebody's got to know what's going on. So I followed the presidents of the United States. I followed guys like Walker and I followed the highest level intelligence people I could. So I spent 25 years around Ron Pandolfi. And the biggest question in ufology is not, what are UFOs? The biggest question in ufology is what the hell's Ron Pandolfi up to? Because he's the guy <laughs> that has the keys. He definitely is the guy that does the briefings. Uh, Kit Green was before him. And before Kit Green was a guy by the name of Arthur Lundahl, who was, uh, mm-hmm. that ran the photographic interpretation lab for the CIA, briefed the Kennedy on, on the Cuban Missile Crisis stuff. He was into UFOs. So you have these guys who are sort of the, the guys who have the keys to the UFO classified material. And Ron Pandolfi always says that all this stuff about zero, zero point energy and all this kind of stuff. It's all techno scam. And I was thinking, well, he's just trying to throw people off or whatever. And the more I look at it, I think like, maybe he's right that he has the stuff and he's saying, this is all garbage. This I anti-gravity stuff, it's all garbage. And because he's always talking about portals, he's always talking about this thing about the portal thing. And his wife talks about portals and they have this guy comes on this radio show and they're talking and I've watched him for 25 years and I'm starting to think, Maybe he's actually right. Maybe this thing. And when you get into portals, then you get into this idea that it's not as physical as you think it is, that they're coming in through portals and they're popping out. Or you get people who uh, describe beings. For example, uh, when people have abduction experiences, most people will say to the guy, okay, so did he probe you? Did you, were you scared? Were you crying? (laughs) And all this kind of stuff. And when I get an experiencer and I say, you had a being, you were talking, you were on the being. And, And they go, yeah. I say, hey, let me ask you a question. So did the being have any clothes on? And they always go, they, they think they're going, uh, no, no, he didn't have any clothes on. And I go, it didn't seem weird to you that you have any clothes on? And they go, no. And I said, did he have any sex organs? I've never had anybody yet say his sex organs. And they're raping the women, but they don't have any sex organs. And so it's like, and they go, no, 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 he didn't have any sex organs. And then I say, well, how do you know it was a male or a female? And they always say the same thing. I, I don't know. I just knew. I just knew it was a female or I always knew it was a male. And, and then you get these things where there's a guy, Israeli guy that I helped him publish his book. He, he talks about the fact that when they leave, and you hear this all the time, they're, they're coming through a portal in the wall. Like Ron Johnson talks about this. The portal opens in the wall. The grays come through the portal. They take a salamander and put it in his face. And then they go back through the portal and the, the wall closes up and stuff like that. And that's not they're flying from here to there. They're popping out of these portal things, which Ron keeps hinting at that this is, this is what it's about. It's the, all the rest of it's techno scam. They're just trying to get money from Congress. And they're, they're promising they can get this stuff, but they haven't got a clue what, the, what they're talking about. And so when I, when I talked to the, the, the Israeli guy, when he's talking about how did the beings leave, and his beings were like green beings. They look like grays, but they're green beings. He said when they left, they all grabbed hands, and they made a circle, and they started to make this circle around and around and around, and they went faster and faster, and then they became translucent, which you hear all the time. The being became translucent. I could see through the being. He didn't have a mouth. He just had a slit. He didn't have nose. He didn't have ears. All these weird things that would tend to indicate to you something's wrong, or Biddy and Barney Hill. They had hats on. So I say, like, what do they got? Baseball team on Zeta Reticuli? There's all these little clues that when you look at the aliens, you go, Something's wrong. There's all these little things that are hinting at you. It's not what you think it is. And he said, so this Yossi Ronan told, told that these beings become translucent and they turn into light and the light goes into a little tiny ball and then the ball disappears. So my question is, is it a flesh and blood ET being or is it a ball of light? 
And if it's a ball of light, then they eat, make, eggs, toast, and coffee. So my impression is that they live in some sort of field where they're not really physical and they come in, they can take on a physical body and they can go back. We can do the same thing. That's what Yossi Ronan was told. You can do the same thing. You just don't realize you can do that thing. Or if you've ever seen this story of, of, of Sherry Wilde, very famous story out of Wisconsin. She writes a story, a book called um, uh, The Forgotten Promise, which is going to be maybe turned into a movie. She has she does her book and, and they basically help her write it. And they have they've given her all this material, whatever. And her the being she's dealing with is called Da. So she gets her book and she goes to the publisher with the book and to the, the publisher is reading it. And it's a gray. It's a it's a she calls it a Zeta. It Da. And the, the publisher is reading it. And he said, well, you've got down here is from uh, Andromeda. And she said, yeah, that's what he said. He's from Andromeda. And then he said, well, he can't be from Andromeda. He's a, he's a Zeta. He's got to be from Zeta Reticulae. So what's going on here? Why don't you go back and ask him? So she goes back and then Da comes and she says to Da, she says, hey, you said you were, uh, you, you're a Zeta. You told me from Alpha, you said you're from uh, Andromeda. So what are you really, are you an alien or what's going on here? And he said, no, that would not best describe who I am. We are etheric beings and we take on a body. She said, why do you take on this ugly looking gray thing for? You scare the living daylights out of me every time. And he said, I scare you. She said, yeah, you wipe my memory every time you come. And she's had a lot of experiences over the years. And um, she said, you wipe my memory. And every time you come, you scare the living daylights out of me. And he said, well, you scare me. Well, you, how about you? You got those big teeth. When you come towards us, we think you're going to eat us. And you hear this over and over again that when you actually ask, I've asked a number of people. There was a, a woman I helped. She's dealing with reptilians. And we, I did her book. And then I did the, the forward to her second book. And she's this whole thing about the reptilian. She's got this reptilian child and all this kind of stuff. And then I'm, I'm suddenly realized, I go, Nancy. You, you were taken in 72, right? Or 62. And she actually went and tracked down. There was police officers. She got people on, on the record. There was a bunch of people when she got taken in, in this craft. And she documents all this stuff. And I said, so you're on the craft in 62 and you were dealing with Mr. Was he there? Was he in the craft? She said, yeah, he was. I said, so what did he look like? Oh, he was a human being with uh, dark hair. I said, so he was, he was one being and then he turned into another being. And that's the thing is, is when you, the more you look at it, the more you realize something's wrong. Or I asked Betty Andreasen. Ben Andreas and her husband, Bob Luca, were first taken in 1946, and they had the experience with the beings. They've written six books on their experience, and they described the beings as these sort of Zeta-type beings or whatever. So I said to, uh, to uh, Bob Wood, I said, you've seen the being, and you're, you were like a little kid, six or seven years old, and now you're like 80 years old or whatever. Uh, did the alien ever get any older? I've asked lots of experiences that. Yes. Nobody says anything different. They say, no. And Bob Luca said, no, but aliens live a long time. It's sort of a justification. No, he never got any older. And that's the thing is like, what is going on here? Are you actually talking to aliens, flesh and blood aliens? Or are you talking to beings that can come in, become physical, and then uh, go back into the field? Let me ask you, th- you, think- let me ask you this, Grant. Is this, is this just part of the phenomenon? Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned earlier in our discussion uh, before we started the program about uh, Stefano Breccia and uh, the Amazitia uh, cases, the friendship cases that took place in Italy. Are you familiar with that? No, no, no. Oh, oh gosh, you got to talk to Paul Harris uh, and, uh, and read those books by Stefano Breccia. But one of the reasons I bring that up is because they, they ask that these human, uh, allegedly human aliens who live among us, some of them allegedly, yeah. uh, where they are from. And the answer that they would get back is, well, uh, what do you mean by where are we? What, it all depends on what you mean by where, you know, what do you mean by, you know, it, maybe they're not from a place. Maybe they're as just as you're saying that they're, they're they come from an, an adjacent reality is what it sounds like. Right. Yeah. Or you go back to Jacques Ballet, who says, yes. you know, this is all nonsense that, that, you know, they used to be fairies and stuff like that. And if you start looking at you, UFO- I've been in ufology so long that I know the patterns. People think that what happens today always happen. And it's like, no, it's a completely different world. If you go back to 1890s to the or the crash in, in Texas and whatever it was Aurora. In, in that period of time, when 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 they talked to the beings, the beings said we're from Mars. And we had this wooden ship with propellers on it, and we came from Mars. And then they, they, in the 50s, they were from Mars, Venus, the back of the moon, and the Canadian alien, AFA, was from, from, from Uranus. And so then we did the rocket program, and we suddenly realized, like, 
now there can't be anybody living on Mars and Venus. And then suddenly, no, they changed. They weren't from Mars and Venus. Now they're from Zeta Reticuli and Pleiades and Andromeda and stuff like that. And then we get in, we get into the whole thing about multidimensional stuff. And now you hear, they, like they'll say, if you go to, to Zeta Reticuli, we're not really there. We're in a, another dimension near that planet, but we're actually fifth dimensional beings or 11th dimensional beings. And it's almost like they're going according to what our belief system is. And that's where where there's that's, a famous that's a really thing. that's a really mean trick. <laughs> well, but but it, but we're doing the same thing. I, th- I think that we're making the assumption. It's the idea. I always use the expression. Will, uh, uh, William Shakespeare said, "All the world's a stage. All the men and women are but actors. They have their entrances and they have their exits, and each man plays many roles." That is the way it works. If you listen to um, um, Whitley Strieber, Whitley Strieber has an expression: "When his wife dies." And his wife dies and she comes to him and gives him a message. She said, Whitley, I am no longer Anne, but I'll always be Anne to you. So what I think is going on is that we are not humans either. We are all etheric beings who go and play a role on a stage. We make the mistake of thinking we're the the player on the stage. We're the actor. You are not an actor on the stage. You are playing an actor on the stage. And, And Anne says, I've left the stage. Whitley, I'm no longer Anne. I'm I'm going on to do something else, but I'll always be because you and I played the play together. I'll always be Anne to you. And it's this idea. That's what Yossi Ronan, they were saying. You can do the same thing. We are etheric beings. That's when you actually confront the aliens. That's what they'll tell you. Can I I tell you something? Can I tell you something? You just you you just uh, really struck a nerve with me today because um, uh, just now because uh, my wife died two years ago just a little over two years ago. And I just uh, published an article on my blog today where I quoted William Shakespeare, uh, all the world's a stage. uh, And, uh, and the article was about the death of my wife. And so, uh, and here now you are talking about that. And, uh, and to me, there are no real coincidences, as you know, Having yeah, yeah. having been doing this, and so I just wanted to point that out to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the key thing. I, one one of the lessons I always tell people is you've got to realize, remember who you actually are. It's this idea that if because one one of the noetic experience I had one in 2012 which had the consciousness. I had one, a really dramatic one in 2017 where I was given 24 things, and it, the things I was given was basically they're saying not only have you got it wrong. It's exactly the opposite of what you think it is. And they would give me stuff like, is the world made out of nuts and bolts? If it is, that's one world. But if it's made out of consciousness, that's a completely different world with completely different rules. And then they said, if it's one life, that's one world. But if it's multiple lives, it's a whole different world. All the rules change. And that's the idea of the stage thing, that you, we are not human beings. We think we're human beings and they're aliens. And that's the way it is. We are all etheric beings that come in and play a role. And if you get into research like Dr. Michael Newton, who did the life between life stuff, the 7,000 regressions, this whole idea that we all get together, you and I may have got together before we were born and say, okay, you're going to do this uh, MUFON radio show and I'm going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to get together. And everything changes once you get the multiple life thing. That we're, and that's the idea that we're, we've got these wrong blocks, that we're assuming this is happening, we're assuming this is right, and it's exactly the opposite. Or the one they gave me, is the world... Is the world random? Because we always believe it's just random. Everything's happening random. Or is it pattern? Is, is the universe repeating patterns and growing and, and learning and stuff like that? And if you, get it, if you get the wrong block, you can shuffle the blocks around as much as you want. You're never going to get the right answer. It's not until you realize you've got some wrong blocks. And we've replaced the, the flat earth block. We've replaced the world goes around. The sun goes around the earth. We've replaced a lot of blocks. But we have the ego that we always assume that we've got it all figured out, or even uh, um, uh, um, Hawking said, uh, we don't need God, we've got the laws of physics. And to which I say, <laughs> well, who the hell is the laws of physics? Like, who are you talking about? And we do these placeholders. We, we, everything and the that- laws of physics change all depending on what kind of a universe you're in, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but everybody assumes that they sort of got it all figured out. Even if you take a look at, we've done it all the time. Max Planck, who was the father of quantum physics, tells the story. In 1874, Jolie, who was his professor, he said, I want to go into, into physics. And Jolie said, you're wasting your time. 
we've discovered everything. You're just wasting your time. There's no point in going into physics. And, and we do this over and over again, or the guy in the head of the patent office in 1916, everything that has been invented has been invented. And we have this ego thing that we believe we've got all these blocks and we refuse to change the blocks. We refuse to believe. And that's what paranormal phenomena teaches you. That if somebody can go through a wall, one of your blocks is wrong. You've got something wrong. You've got to figure out what's going on. And when you hear these things about Ron Johnson saying, I'm in the spirit world, and the be- the thing inside the spirit world, the-, the building is 10 times the size. Or the other one he told me, when he's in this building, he says his mother takes him down to the end of the building, and there's this table where there's these crystals. And these crystals come out of the table. And, and the, the crystals, he said, you can look at the crystal and you can see your life. Now, his, he said, his mother said, your crystal won't come until you die. So he said, I see my dog had a crystal. So he, he's got the dog, his dog's crystal. And he said, I never knew what happened to my dog. So he looks at the crystal and he, he looks at it and he, he sees that the neighbor shot the dog. He saw the end of the, the, the life. Now, the key thing to that is if you go back to UFO Cover Up Live in 1988, which I say was a CIA drop. It was you take information, you surround it by disinformation, you put it out. Richard Doty, who's playing the Falcon in that documentary, mm-hmm. if you see in that documentary, he says the most amazing thing that I saw in my entire career was the aliens showed us a crystal. And in the crystal, you could take a look and you could see you could see the life of Christ. You could see all the stuff. And, and that is not coincidence to me, where you see this thing about the crystal. You look at it at a certain angle. And I remember in the 1980s working with Linda Howe and people like that, because I was they were leaking all these stories. Grant, the, Grant, the hang, on, hang, on, hang on one second, because yeah. we have to uh, mention Clifford Stone here, uh, because Clifford uh, also said that uh, at least one of the extraterrestrials that he purportedly communicated with uh, carried with him a crystal and then and in this crystal was contained images of of his loved ones a, as though we would carry something in our wallets but that's how, how it, that he showed this crystal to clifford and and these images and and, and things were contained within it yeah and and that's i think the mistake we make is we sort of assume like a lot of people still want to be in the nuts and bolts things like measure stuff and stuff like that. And we don't take into consideration the fact that, that the experiencers are just reporting what they're seeing. And that when they come up with this weird stuff that agrees with other stuff, we got to say, maybe this is a hint, go down this road, like people flying the flying saucer, where you get 50 people. Or I remember Ray Hernandez, when they did the 3000 experiences, 14% of the people in that survey that answered it said they'd flown the craft. And I said, don't you think we should talk to these people? This is an indication that this is a clue as to how this thing works, that when you get that many people, because if you're going to make up a story, you're not going to say, oh, I flew the craft with my mind, or, uh, you know, I was inside a building and it was 10 times the size, the UFO was 10 times the size. That's not something you're going to make up. That's something that someone had to have seen because it makes no common sense. And yet when you, you put all these stories together, you start to see these parallels in all these stories that that's where I think you got to go. You got to go down these things and realize we've got something wrong and that the understanding, and I, to me, it's always comes back to consciousness that everything is made out of consciousness. Consciousness vibrates, the illusion begins and you have different vibrations. And so there people always describe they're vibrating at a higher level. Like when you're around a being, it's very hard to be around a being because they're vibrating at this very high level. It's very intense to be around them. And that that's this idea that everything is vibration. Everything is, and, and you go down that, that road and start going there you start getting some answers it may not be you know technological answers but it starts to explain what might be going on let me ask you this um is there a why is there an answer to the question why is there a communication between uh the these otherworldly entities if you will and and our uh, apparently nuts and bolts world is there is there a purpose to it i i think jacques valet would say that it's somewhat similar to a i guess he would liken it to some kind of a video game that you once you get to a certain level then the game changes a little bit it it, it progresses as you progress but it's it, the purpose of it is is to take us to some different place but yeah. have you gotten to a why why this oh yeah a- I, I have a whole theory about it i have a, given a lecture a few times i call it the theory of wow and so when i saw the object the second night and it was flying away, I said to myself, what's it doing? It's not doing anything. It's just flying along. So when people st- tell me they saw a UFO, I'll always say, so how long did it last? They go, three seconds. And I go, so what was it doing? It wasn't doing anything. And it's like, so why do UFOs have lights on them? So you can see them. 
They want right. you to see them. That's right. why they put lights on the craft. We don't have lights on our craft. That's why they, and, and so everything is the theory of wow. So what I say is the intelligence just wants you to go, wow, what the heck is going on here? I, I've, I've just written a book on triangles. So, so it's a I lesson. Talk- the, 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 les- the lesson is, uh, uh, this is like a, a a pencil being shoved through a two dimensional world, right? It's the th- yeah. the third dimension or the fourth, fifth, sixth, ninth, twenty first dimension, and they are poking pencils into our two dimensional world, right? Yeah, they're just trying to get our attention. So if if you get the experiences, like I'm doing a book on triangles, and I go through all the people, and how many? What's the percentage? It's pretty high. How many per- experiencers who have been on the ship who have triangles? I have one woman who has these triangles. I said, "Man, those are beautiful triangles." One on one wrist, one on the other wrist appeared the same night, and the one had it was the triangle was all cl- closed in red. The other one had these lines through it. Just beautiful, clear triangles. Like why would it, why would an intelligence put a triangle on your wrist? Why did they take people's clothes like and put your clothes inside out and backwards? It happens all the time. And people say, oh, the aliens are stupid. They, they, they just couldn't put the clothes on right. And it's like, no, when they wake up, you go, that, oh, man, that was a horrible dream. And then you look at your wrist and you go, oh, shoot, that wasn't a dream. And all they're doing is saying, wake up, take a look around. Something, you got a wrong block. Something's going on. And you see it all, everything. Why did they do the crop circles? They don't want you to figure anything out. They just want you to go, that is amazing. How did they, something's going on. I'm, I'm going to figure out what's going on here. Or I said, I always say Linda Howe and all, all the people who do the cattle mutilation say, Linda, so why did they take all the blood out of the cow? Like every last drop of blood out of the cow. Because if they didn't, you wouldn't pay attention. Why did they take the cow? They've got the abducted cow and they take the cow and they fly off of the cow and they're doing whatever they're doing to it. And then they fly back into the war zone and drop it in the minute in the neighbor's yard from a hundred feet out. And they have all these bizarre cuts. Why do they do that? Cause they want, I said to Linda, they want you to go and take photographs. They want, this is a message. They want you to wonder what is going, why are they doing this? And then you get these things where people come up with these uh, conclusions. Well, it's downwind and downstream from nuclear power activities and stuff like this and you start to piece this stuff together that they're not doing anything they just want you to go wow they want you to stop and realize the world is not what you think it is so they're purposely leading us to something yeah yeah just to to evaluate and the more we evaluate like you and i when you start to to look at it and you start putting the pieces together you say no i think this is going on and you start to realize different elements of reality that people have got wrong. It, the number one one is that consciousness is primary. When you, the more you look at the UFO phenomena, the more you realize it is not as physical as people think it is. It is, it's got this consciousness element where they, they can move people through walls. They can, uh, you know, how many people see anybody being abducted? It's this idea, like Jacques Vallée said, there are no abductions, period. Uh, Edgar Mitchell said, no abductions. And it's not that there's no event, but the event that we think is going on is not the event that we think is going on. It's something different because you, you get all these weird elements like Jack Valet says, this is absolute nonsense that they've come across the galaxy to do this kind of crazy stuff. And that's the thing is when you start looking at the anomalies, I think even Einstein said that discoveries come from anomalies. When you get an anomaly, you realize something's wrong. And, and, and so they're just giving us these weird sort of things that stop us in our tracks and make us take a closer look at what's going on. And that's when we make the discoveries. So where's the final destination? I don't think there is. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, of growing that, as you know, people around you probably don't, aren't interested in UFOs. Everybody's at their own sort of level. And that you and I are sort of at a level where we're sort of ahead of the game. We sort of realize something weird is going on here. But everybody has their thing. It's it's the idea of all the world's a stage that people come in for different reasons that you and I uh, or people will complain. So I say you always got to realize whatever your situation in the world is, if reincarnation is a fact, then you chose to come in at this time at this place in the middle of whatever mess you think you find yourself in or whatever mystery you find yourself in. And perhaps you came for a reason. And that's the idea that I I came into the world probably to do something. And when I leave, they're only going to ask one question, how did it work out? And I'm the one to put the people on the stage. And and what am I here to do? And, and the UFO experience, I'll always ask the people on the ship. I'll say, do you think you have a mission? And everybody says the same thing. They'll either say, yeah, I got a mission. They'll tell you what the mission is, or they'll say, yeah, I think I've got a mission, but I don't know what it is. It's the idea that they're, that they're part of a plan, that something's going on, and they're part of it. So th- that, that leads, you to my, or leads me to my next question, uh, which is, uh, is the uh, intelligence, the intellect, the uh, consciousness that you are, 
is that consciousness able to make a determination to make a decision about what life they want to live? Uh, and, and let me, and, and in asking that, uh, does that necessarily mean that we have to live here, that we have to live those lives here? If there was a vast universe out there, isn't it possible that we might choose to say, uh, live on, uh, in a completely different place than what we perceive as being the earth. Maybe we want to live in a different galaxy and be a, oh, yeah. and, and be a, a different kind of an intelligent being with, with uh, in a completely different social structure with a completely different physical structure. Is that, is that possible? Uh, do oh, we make, can, we make, can we make those decisions? Well, you would make that decision in between lives. Newton talks about this all the time, that people are different planets. Or when you talk to people, a lot of experiencers will say, that's my family. I belong to them. My fam- my, my, I was born to th- these people. Patty Smith, who was the first woman to sing on Saturday Night Live, said, I was dropped. I am not from here. John Denver said I'm he wrote a song called spirit it was released after he died he believed he was from the constellation Lyra so you can go into these these different things and to have these different experiences and a lot of experiences actually believe that their family is the that their part that they were an alien they were part of this thing they're part of this uh, their family that that took them and it's this connection that you can go wherever you want have whatever experiences you want and that we've chosen at this time and this place to come in or I, I asked like Mary Rodwell in terms of the experiences, so she's done like 3000 regressions. I've asked all the big, uh, you know, people who do the regressions. I said, uh, if you regressed everybody back and you said it's like to birth and say, at any point in the past, did you agree to be in this situation? The abduction experience, how many people would say, yes, Mary Rodwell said hundred percent. I asked Kathy Martin who runs the experience program for MUFA. I said, Kathy, what do you believe about this, this soul contract thing that these people, this is all on agreement that pe- this is a plan that at certain this point, we're going to have nuclear weapons and we're all going to come in and we're doing this plan. We're going to try to raise the consciousness before the world gets destroyed. And this is all a plan. She said, I've always wondered about that. She, she said, I actually had myself regressed back to birth. And I heard the voice. I heard the words come out of my mouth. I agreed to this. And it's this idea that we are here. It's a stage. And we've come in at this particular time that we have we have a job to do that. I always say that if you have a, a, a knowledge, I always say this is a Super Bowl of all stories. If you understand what's going on, you are in the Super Bowl. You are on the field. You may be the water boy, the quarterback, whatever. You are in the field and you you got to and you got to realize that the people on the outside can say, oh, I didn't know what was going on. But you and I know what's going on and that you got to figure out what is my role here? What am I doing? What, what's this all about? Why are these synchronicities happening? What am I supposed to do? And and that's the belief that where I got this download is if it's a random world, then it's a random world and it's, you know, we're biological robots in a random meaningless universe. But if it's a pattern world and if it's multiple life world, then maybe you are part of a plan and you're supposed to do something and you got to figure out what you're supposed to do. And it's the idea, remember who you actually are. We are not human beings. They are not aliens. We are etheric beings taking on bodies to play a role to raise evolution, that we're all part of the one and that the, uh, the world is evolving. Everything, that's the number one message. 54% of all experiences, according to the this, this survey from Free, said the number one message is oneness, to realize we are all part of the same thing. There is no division. We are them. They are us. And that we're all playing this role. And that whatever we do to the environment, we do to that whatever we do to, to, to in the day will affect the environment. And that when the atomic bomb went off, that's when they came because we have to realize it's a bell. It's a giant bell. And that when we ring this corner of the bell, the whole bell rings and they knew that we had detonated the atomic bomb. And they said that the bomb would affect the rest of the universe. It's all one thing. That's what Ben rich. That was the idea. Do you, what do you understand about ESP? Everything in time and space is connected. It's all one thing. There's no out there, out there. It's all one thing. It all vibrates together and that it's all connected. And uh, so that's the, the message is remember who you actually are. You're an etheric being who's playing a role. They're playing a role. We're playing a role. And and that's when you get into the evil alien thing where I say, this is absolute nonsense. If you get into, oh, there's these evil aliens. And I go, this is racism. The idea that there are evil aliens and good aliens or good people and bad people. There are just souls that are reincarnating. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody does good things and bad things. And the idea that there are uh, that that a whole race, whether they be aliens or Chinese or Japanese or whatever, that they that that everybody is born. And the concept would be if if you believe there are evil races, that the grays are evil, well, what happens if you die and you suddenly are born a gray? Are you now an evil person? This is absolute nonsense. Everybody is a soul incarnating, everybody does good 
good and bad things. They may be at a higher vibrating level that they understand more of the rules, but we have to realize it's all one thing. And we're all just beings that take on physical bodies and are playing a game, like a, like a big computer game or whatever the analogy that people want to use now. It's all an, uh, almost like it's all an illusion that, that we are playing this, this, uh, this thing and we've got to get away from the idea that we are physical beings. So they will say they're, they're, they're impersonating aliens. Well, we're impersonating humans. We actually, actually got to the point where we believe, we actually believe we're humans. So let's, we're, so let's, let's take a minute then, then to talk about Stephen Greer. Yeah, uh, and and the CE five uh, protocols, uh, and uh, um, because we've been talking about this interaction with, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, extra terrestrials, if you will, extra extra yep. uh, uh, ultra terrestrials, and um, Doctor Greer is uh, has put forth the CE five protocols, and we have people all over the world doing that. Uh, yep. We and there there are some of us who uh, want to uh, enter into this communication with these other other beings, and so you spoke earlier about uh, Wilbur Smith, yeah, and uh, the fact that he was communicating with extraterrestrials, or at least uh, the uh, uh, rumor that he was co- uh, communicating with extraterrestrials via radio somehow. Did you ever figure that out? Did you ever uh, determine? Uh, uh, perhaps what the radio frequencies were that he was using. Uh, whether uh, we he had the actually- radio frequency. I, I can tell you a couple of things about that. Um, I asked um, the guy, his name is Art, Art Bridge, who was his metallurgist. So Wilbur was getting a lot of material from the United States. And I maintain all the material that is, that people have is not falling off flying saucers. It's being dropped. They're actually dropping the stuff for us. It's the same thing in theory. Wow. So he was getting this material. And so I asked the the guy that was doing the metal analysis. He was a guy from the department of defense here in Canada. And I said, well, how was Wilbur making contact? How was this contact? And he said, well, there really wasn't direct contacts. There was a couple, but really not. He used all sorts of methods. So he would, he would have contacts. He had a woman that lived down the street from Betty and Barney Hill. Famous woman, uh, Frances Swan, if you've ever heard the story, 1959, she teaches a Navy intelligence guy. Navy intelligence is watching this woman. She was one of the people who was in contact with AFA. She was giving the material to the Canadians. She And she taught this Navy intelligence guy. Uh, Nisham, I think, was the guy's name in 1959. He goes running back to the CIA. He's all excited. She told teach him how to channel AFA. And he goes, and this is in a um, uh, the documentary, UFOs, Past, Present, and Future by Robert Emenegger. Uh, Arthur Lundahl, who was the first um, uh, head of the Weird Desk, comes and they drop this thing into the documentary. And and so uh, um, Bob Emenegger says to Lundahl, he says, uh, well, can you go on camera and tell the story? He says, I can't. And he said, what do you mean you can't? I'm on duty. I can't do this. So they get Robert Friend, the head of Blue Book, to tell the story. And in there, they they go and, and uh, they tell the story about July 1959, Nisham comes back from Maine from this Francis Swan woman and um, she teaches him how to do the channeling thing. And Arthur, Arthur Lundahl says, okay, great. Sit down. Let's, let's talk to the alien. So they sit him down and Robert friend tells a story on this UFOs uh, uh, past, present, future documentary. And he said, we, we, he was there and his Adam's apples bouncing up and down and, and they're having these communication. They're asking this alien, all these questions about, you know, is there a, a, a chosen religion and stuff like that. And then Arthur Lundahl says, we'd like some proof. And then the guy goes from automatic writing, which they used at that time, goes from automatic writing to voice. And he says, what do you want? He said, we want you to show yourself. He says, go to the window. And Robert friend on this documentary goes to the window and, and you can see the Capitol, and this UFO goes flying by the window. Now, uh, uh, Valet gave me the, the document, the handwritten document from that. So that was one of the ways they had this AFA. And the, they had, Wilbur Smith was working on the, the radio thing that you talked about. He was trying to get this radio thing going. He was, had this coil. He was exchanging it with the Damsky and people like that, working on this thing. So he was using that. I'm not sure how much radio. I remember the, the guy that gave me the initial uh, lead on it from uh, my father's office said, I remember one day we were in, in, uh, they were at Shirley's Bay, which is outside of Ottawa. It's a, like a, um, a very secure top secret area where they have all the, the, the antennas where they're trying to pick off Russian communications and stuff. And he said, I went there one Sunday afternoon. He said, there's all these cars in the parking lot. I go, what's going on? Like, what's everybody doing here? And they were in the building and the, the head, the guy who was running the radio, the big radio there, Wilbur was saying, make the communication. 
And he said, no, it's an illegal communication. I can't make it. Whoever says, make the communication. And they were, they were, he had this frequency, which I, 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 I didn't back of my head. I know what the frequency is. But uh, the, the guy said, no, we're not going to make the communication. Um, uh, the other thing they used was um, Wilbur would, um, the same thing uh, um, Gary Nolan uses. Gary Nolan, who does the DNA stuff from Stanford. Uh-huh. Gary, Gary Nolan says, I don't know how it works but I know how to make it work. And he tells a story how he works through the problem and stuff. And he puts it beside his bed. He puts the question beside his bed. He wakes up in the morning and the answer is in his head. And Wilbur Smith would use this process. So he'd put a pad beside the bed and he'd wake up in the morning and all this, the writing would be there. And then he'd go into the lab and they were working on this gravity control experiment that, that AFA was showing him how to do this gravity control thing. And he would come into the lab and he'd say, oh, Alpha said this, Alpha said this. And they would work on according to the stuff that was written on this paper. And they told, and Wilbur actually wrote about it at one point, but they, then the metallurgist guy told me uh, the one, they were Saturday morning, they were working on this gravity control experiment in the garage. So I had this thing and they had this, this plate and they had a, le- um, uh, a copper plate and it had these uh, permanent magnets glued onto the plate. And they were spinning it at about 18,000 revs a second. And they were ready to run this thing. And all of a sudden the phone rings and they had a blind telex communicator, a, a telex operator, a blind telex operator says, I have a message from AFA. He said, shield the experiment. So I was, and Wilbur <laughs> said, shut, shut it down, shut down the experiment. And they built a brick wall around. And Wilbur talks about this in one article. They built this brick wall around this thing. They started up and the thing exploded. There was ceramic magnets in the wall. And Wilbur said someone would have been seriously injured. So they were using every technique they could find in terms of trying to make the contact. And, and the, the thing would be that he was talking to what he thought was an alien. So it always will go according to where you believe. Cause they, I remember the, 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 the guy, the uh, metallurgist said, at no time did we ever believe this guy was from Uranus. I mean, we're not stupid. And, and yet the, the thing was saying it was from Uranus. So that's the thing is where they're, they're going according to what your uh, level of understanding is. So in 1890, they would say they're from Mars. And we were looking at canals on Mars at the time. Everybody thought Mars was invaded. It was, uh, was uh, occupied and stuff like that with the telescopes. And so they move according to our, our belief system. And as we change, as we come into the space age, then they turn into aliens and this kind of stuff. So I believe that they're, they're going according to a reflection of what we see or the idea that John Mack came and, and a lot of people describe is if you see a gray, you're in fear that that's why you see a gray. If you're a very high energy person, you can see a reptilian. If you're a very religious person, you're going to see an angelic being or an etheric being and stuff like that, that we have to realize we are part of what we're seeing. People think there's this independence, there's separation, there's me and there's you. No, no, it's all one thing that you got to realize you're part of what you're seeing, that you are ma- you are partly manifesting what you're seeing, that things are not physical, even though they look physical, the world is not flat, even though it looks flat, that you are you are interpreting things that may not be true. Let me ask you this, what would the uh, what would uh, Seth Shostak say about all that? Well, Seth is, is Seth is into the left brain. I mean, he's he's sort of into the world where this is all total nonsense, and that's where we got to get away from trying to convince people who are not going to be convinced. There's there's absolutely no way. I remember I've got the Stanton Friedman files. I'm the guy that goes out, and I've got six thousand pages of Stanton Friedman's files. And because of COVID, I haven't been able to go back. But I I, I use the example of him. So he argued with Seth Shostak and Class and Oberg and Menzel and all this kind of stuff, and he would always say the same thing. I, I, I lecture, I, we had a debate at Oxford and 78% of the people say it, I won the debate. And yet if you go back and say, how many people did Stan ever convince? Did he convince Phil Class of anything? No, everybody just backs in their corner. It's like the American politics. People can hear the same speech and they will say exactly the opposite. And when they confront, they will move farther back in their corners. That's the way it works. It's our belief system that it, that is that is influencing this whole thing. So you can't convince these, or or as um, what was it? Who was it said? I think it was Max Planck said, "Science," and I would say, "Science and ufology advance one funeral at a time." It is not that you convince. And so if Max Planck, who invented quantum physics, had the problem of trying to convince people that quantum physics was real and said science advances one funeral at a time, we should learn the same lesson. You're not going to convince anybody. you got to figure it out for yourself and put it out there. And the younger people come along and they get acclimatized or what happened with the New York Times. I remember back in the day, everybody thought, well, this is absolute nonsense. And John Alexander and people say, no, there's no UFO program. This is absolute total nonsense. And slowly these leaked stories came out about this and that. And then, of course, the New York Times came out in, in, in 19, uh, 2017 and said, yeah, there's a UFO program. And everybody went, 
yeah, whatever. I knew it was going to happen because I remember Stephen Greer talking about the fact that when it would be disclosed, there was a UFO program, people, the stock market would melt down. People would commit suicide and stuff. Nothing happened. It was this acclimatization that the younger generation, the old people die off. The younger generation says, yeah, we know there's aliens. I mean, just tell us what's going on. And it's this gradual thing that slowly evolves that there's not going to be a day when when it all sort of unravels, unless the New York Times comes out with it. It's a gradual process. And even I say, even if we, the, the, the idea that it's multiple lives and it's, it's, it's infinity is that even if we destroy the world, we're still coming to learn our lessons. You're still going to evolve. It doesn't, doesn't mean we have to save the world. It doesn't mean you have to solve it right now, this sort of stuff. It's what I came into the world to do something. I'm going to leave. I'm going to get asked one question, how to work out. I got to figure out what I'm doing. It really doesn't matter what the world is doing. It doesn't matter what somebody down the street believes or what they say. It matters. I'm, I only have to figure out what I'm here because when I leave, I can't say, well, you know, if I had been lived in New York and if Hillary Clinton hadn't played with the emails and if the dog had eaten my homework and my mother-in-law hadn't pissed me off, I would have done something. No, no, it's about you. You, you you can only answer for yourself. That's all you have to worry about. So it really doesn't matter whether these guys, cause I was in, I was involved with Phil class. I knew some of these guys. I remember I used to argue with James Obert uh-huh, in the yeah. 1990s when the internet first came up, when they had these chat is he boards. Still, is, did he pass away? Is he still alive? No, no, he's still there. He's still around. Uh-huh. And, and I remember I would argue with him and, and I, I got into this thing where I, I, he would say something and then I was like, I'll get James Oberg. And then I would do this thing. I'd work for two hours and I put this elaborate to explanation why, why, of why he James was wrong. Oberg was wrong. Right. And within 30 <laughs> seconds, within 30 seconds, he would reply with something else. And then I would spend two hours again. And in the end, you know how I ended it? I said, James, do you have a job? Cause you could put it on three o'clock in the morning. You could put it on any time of day. He would answer within 30 seconds. I say, do you have a job? Do you actually do something? Or do you just sit on this board? And that's when he sort of backed off. And, and I even had him at one point, I thought I had him on, if you remember the James, um, the um, Danny Sheehan tells a story about yeah. Marcia Smith talking about the uh, Jimmy Carter getting this yes. classified report. And James Oberg was friends with Marcia Smith at the congressional uh, library and she had done this report. And then he said, I don't believe she said that. And I said, well, go ask her, go ask her. And then, uh, then he came and he said, I talked to her. Did you, did you talk to her? I said, okay. So what did she say? Did she say that there was five uh, classes that Carter was there? There's this classified report done for Carter. I'm not going to say, I said, Oh, come on. And then, then he, then he wouldn't talk to me because I said, tell me what Marsha Smith <laughs> you're told right, you. You're right. You're right. And, <laughs> That's and why. but that's the thing. He, they <laughs> Guys are like that skeptics. It, I, I talk about it as left brain. It's ego. It's left brain. It's left brain interpreter. There's a thing that. But, but Grant, don't don't you think that that folks that are that are in uh, in Oberg's uh, position, uh, and also uh, you know Seth Shostak, I've had some interaction with him that they they sort of look at it as their job to to tamp this down. Uh, that that maybe there's a motivation there aside from their own skepticism that that they've gone or the, beyond or that. Yeah, or they've got vested interest. I mean, they've got vested interest that that if if Seth Shostak admits that that yeah they're here, uh, he's out of his job. job's gone. Right. Or, or or like you get uh, what's his name, Elon Musk. I mean, he's on this thing about you know the, you know there's the, this is all garbage, whatever. And you take a look, his company went from a hundred from fifty billion to a hundred billion dollars, and he's going to put rockets on Mars. Well, of course he's going to say. I mean, it's this vested interest. That's what Ron Pendolfi was talking about with this with this techno scam thing. That you always have to realize that there's money at the bottom of this thing, and whatever you're promoting is 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 where you're at so you're going to promote what you want to, to make money to keep your thing going and um i'm, I'm in a different position because i really don't need anybody's money i don't need anything to me it's this mystery of what was that thing that i saw and i don't have but if i was you know in a situation where i or I worked at a university and I always say, you know, I worked at a university, I had the keys to the president's office, eight vice president's office, the payroll, human resources. I had keys to every room in the university. I was a big manager there, security and uh, uh, operations manager. And and if, if I had known what was going on, do you think I would have left six months before there was a buyout? I didn't know what was going on. You only know your little piece of the puzzle and you protect your little piece and you just do your little job. And everybody thinks that because somebody's in the government, they know what's going on. They really don't. I would say if there's people that know that maybe Pandolfi and a couple other people that know, it's going to be very, very limited to the number of people that actually know what's going on. Even if you look at the Wilson leak document where the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff was trying to figure out what's going on. He couldn't figure out what's going on either. And he was told you either back off this thing, or you're going to lose a couple of stars. You realize that this thing is very tightly held. And it's because 
uh, number number one, because the military is always into this thing where everybody's an enemy, everybody's a threat. So we've, we've got to keep it away from the Russians or whatever. And the other thing that I say that people don't realize when it comes to the cover-up is that all the people that are working on the program are people that there's a lot of money at this. Um, I knew Tyler D from American Cosmic. I met him in 2013. And he talked about his download experience that he had when he got this invention thing. And the invention he got, he believes he talks to the beings. He's got 40 patents. He talks about his contact with the beings, how he can contact with the beings and stuff. He's the head NASA guy. And he told me about his, 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 his being standing at the end of the bed and stuff like that when he was, when he was talking to me. Uh, one of his inventions, uh, apparently it's sold, the company he sold on NASDAQ for $100 million. So you got to realize that if you're a scientist working on this thing and you're on the leading edge, all scientists, whether it's Nolan or, or Pen, uh, put off or all these people, everybody has patents. There's a lot of money. If you're a scientist working on this thing and you're on the leading edge, you're not going to release it because you don't want everybody else filing the patent. You want to file the patent there. And so there's all these things inside that people don't realize that are part of the cover up in terms of why people are coming up. It's not necessarily, I, again, I don't believe there's bad people. I believe that everybody thinks they're saving the world, no matter how bad you might think they are. They think they're, you know, it may be stealing everybody's stuff is saving the world and, and getting their family rich or whatever, but everybody thinks they're, they're doing what they're doing. And you got to see what's the vested interest. Why are they saying what they're saying? So Seth Strasnack is quite obvious why he's going to to fight it. Or if you're Michael Shermer and you're the editor of Skeptor magazine and he had the experience, if you know the experience he had with his wife when he gets married to the to his wife and they have the radio, you the story about the radio where the radio starts to play on his wedding day and has no has no batteries in it and it's broken and he couldn't fix it and it plays for the entire day. And and then he says, Weird things happen. So what? It's just an anomaly. And and so <laughs> So even a guy, Skeptic Magazine, can talk his way out of one of the most bizarre skeptic, the bizarre things that happen, that people have their vested interest and people people have beliefs and it's very hard to shift people off beliefs. We have to we have to realize that it's the young people that come up that 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 uh, have the that are open to new ideas, almost like I think Einstein had said, you spend from the time when you're zero to 25 inventing things. And after 25, you spend the rest of your life defending what you did. Well, the the theme of our show tonight, Grant, is uh, what's next, and we've we've talked a little bit about well, we've talked uh, you've talked a lot about uh, about uh, where we are headed in terms of uh, consciousness, uh, what is, what lies at the bottom of, of this phenomenon. Uh, we have a, a somewhat of an admission that these objects are real, that they come from somewhere else, wherever that might be, and so. Uh, you know, organizations like MUFON, our job is to take upon the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. Well, UFOs exist. There's no question about that anymore. It's just a matter of fact. It's a matter of science. And so what's next? Uh, do, do we or do people like us continue to look at impressions in the ground and take readings of these impressions with Geiger counters, uh, record the data and put that data into databases and then study the database to determine the physical effects of these objects and the things and things like that. Uh, or is there a greater mission out there? Is there what's next? It, 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 certainly it has to be related to exo politics uh, and uh, inter interaction with these other beings whatever whatever they might be wherever they might be from yeah uh i think with the sightings because that's what i when i had the the book was wasn't published in the 70s that's when i gave up on the sighting thing um sightings will teach you that yes you are dealing with a phenomena that and it's probably not from here the same as i have the objection with the people who are doing the metal i actually went to hell put off and i said to hell put off i said hell you know, this metal you're collecting, this is a port material. <laughs> you had it in the lab in the 1970s with Yuri Geller. If you know the story about Yuri Geller, where they're in, working with Yuri Geller in your remote viewing lab, and they go and they're, they're having lunch or whatever, and Yuri Geller suddenly bites down on this thing and cuts his lip, and he pulls this thing out of his mouth, and it's the uh, Air Force pin from, or whatever, I think it's a pin from uh, um, uh, Edgar Mitchell, who's sitting at the table. And Edgar says, where did you get that from? That's my pin. I lost that in Houston two years ago. And, and then they go back to the lab and they're in the lab and they're, 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 Yuri Geller's in another room and all of a sudden they hear his tink, 
behind them and the back half of the pin falls on the floor behind them. And that's what I said to hell. I said, hell, this has got to be a port material. You know, they're, they're, there's no, you don't come across the, the universe and have a little piece of start to fall off the flying saucer. And, and then he said, hell's usually very short. He said, uh, we'll analyze the material one step at a time. So he didn't deny. So, so may- clarify, you, you're, you're, you're saying apport material, not, 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 a port, not a port material, but apport material. Yeah, right? well, either pronunciation, yeah. Like, like in physical mediumship, where I think yes. a lot of people are going, where you see, phys- uh, I just did an interview with Leslie Kane and a guy by the name of Stuart Alexander. I just put it on my YouTube channel and she talks about the hand. I said, this is the most important story I've ever heard in my life. And I said to Stuart Alexander, I mean, you could not have had a better witness than Leslie Kane from the New York Times. Very conservative. I knew her when she started the UFO thing. She's very conservative. She will not say anything stupid. She doesn't really realize. She's the big New York Times reporter. She's not going to get out on the limb or whatever. And she talks about this hand where she's at the table and this sort of watery thing comes and this thing appears and appears into this hand and she feels the hand and she's done it a number of times and she's feeling the fingers and it's warm and it's good like baby skin or whatever. And then the hand just dematerializes back into the table. And I said, that is important stuff. That is what you got to look at. And that shows you like, we have got something wrong. We are not that. And that's the, the idea that stuff can be, they can make stuff appear, disappear, and that they're dropping this stuff that, that you can, you can look at the material and like Jacques Vallée, he's got this new book and he's probably going to get into this thing about the, the, the metal that it has these, these uh, you know, it's built one atom at a time and it's probably done in, in outer space and that the isotopes are all wrong and we don't have this on, on earth and stuff like that. And it still doesn't get you. It just gets you to the fact that, yeah, this probably ain't ours. But the thing is, wh- where is it from? And more importantly, why are they dropping this stuff? And what they're doing is, it's the theory of wow. They're going, everybody's to go, and that's what's next. So people, consciousness, when I first brought up consciousness, Colin Anders is doing it. Then I brought up, now it's a key word. Everybody's using it. Nobody's afraid to use it. When I first used the word consciousness, everybody cut me off. Like the guy's nuts. He's, he's insane. He's lost it or whatever. Now it's a key word. People realize there may be a consciousness connection to this thing. Jacques Vallée is putting this stuff out. Uh, you get more and more of this material where they're looking at, uh, for example, um, Kit Green, if you've read uh, Peniston's book. They're looking at experiences, but I think it's very important work where Peniston, they go to get Peniston's DNA. And Peniston says, you're not just going to get my DNA. I'm going to roll over like John Burroughs. I mean, I want to know what the heck you're doing. Like, what, what are you coming to me? What do you want my DNA and all this kind of stuff for? And he said, well, we're, we're sort of looking at propulsion. And then he says, come on, you think I'm stupid? Like propulsion, they're not looking at propulsion. He says, well, maybe I use the wrong word. We're trying to figure out, this is Kit Green, ran the weird desk, has been with hell put off one of the longest held top secret SCI clearances in the country, says, we're trying to figure out how does the phenomena pop in and pop out just as quickly. So they're working on it and they're looking at experiences and that's what you got to go. You got to go to the experiencers and, and find out how do they have this contact? What are they, what are they being told? And, and these kind of things. And I think on the leading edge, you see this, they're looking at the, the DNA of the experiencers. They're looking at the, the fMRIs of the, the experiencers, this caught it putainment thing that these people have a connection inside the brain that they can make contact. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to get to the people. You're never going to figure out the UFO phenomena by looking at sightings in the sky or by metal. You're going to determine, yeah, it's something paranormal. It's only when you talk to the people who are actually interacting with the intelligence band of phenomena that you have any chance of figuring this thing out. Everything else just proves, yeah, there's something going on here. Crop circles, cattle mutilations, it all just proves, yeah, something weird is going on and it's probably not the government. It's probably not us. Something's going on. It's not until you talk to the experiencers who will actually tell you what's going on. They will actually tell you what they experienced. And that's, I think, where we got to go next is to seriously listen to these people and you can give them lie detectors you can do whatever you want but at least listen to them because 40 percent of all experiences according to the the free survey say at one point during their experience they knew the answer to everything in the universe the same thing as people have near-death experiences say at one point during their experience they knew the answer to everything in the universe 42 percent of all experiences say they have mathematical scientific or technical material in their head didn't did not learn in school i've got one that i just got maybe two months ago, guy sent me this paper, like a hundred pages, diagrams, mathematical equations. And he said, I'm trying to get somebody to tell me, I got this from them. I don't know what it is. We don't even know who to send it to. Is our, is our evolution being directed? Is that's what's taking place here? Is our, is our evolution being prodded and directed by a higher consciousness? Yeah. Yeah. They're moving us. They're moving us to the next step. And the way they move you to the next step is by making you think. 
and to realize you've got something wrong. That's where the where you make the move when you realize we've got we've got an anomaly. We've got to figure out the anomaly, and then you start looking at things that experiences talk about like this thing where the craft is bigger on the inside than it is outside. And when you get numerous people describing this, you say, this is going to tell us something. If we can figure this out and um, realize that some of these people can actually get answers from this intelligence, they can actually interact with it. And that's where we're going. We're going more and more to consciousness. We're going to the Jacques Vallée, where I used to think Jacques Vallée was crazy. I think Jacques Vallée is right on in terms of what he what what he came up with many years ago, that it's some sort of idea. And even the idea of the computer, the, the simulation idea. I mean, that's only in the last couple of years. I mean, that's a UFO idea. And the more we look at um, the, the bizarre sort of uh, um, ideas of Eastern mysticism and stuff like that, the more we realize that's they're they're going to be conf- confirmed that the ufo stuff is starting to confirm a lot of stuff that people have been saying for thousands of years in terms of how does the world really work and that's a mistake we're making we make a bunch of assumptions that are wrong will we ever become an interstellar or intergalactic civilization well again that comes down to is there actually intergalactic or is it all one thing is it all here now is is the idea there is no is the that's the the um uh, spooky action of distance that Einstein hated so much. The idea that there may not be space. It may be all here now. Everything is an action inside consciousness, that kind of stuff. That's or John Wheeler. There's no out there, out there. Those are the kind of things that are really going to upset people that, that we've got to get to that. That may be what it's at, that there, it's all one thing. It's all here. It's all now that it's this uh, sort of illusionary idea because and you come down to it, and whether you can go past the speed of light or whatever, it's still you got to put all this um, food inside a craft and get it going at the speed of light and stuff like that. It, it, it's still the the original skeptical view is is confirmed that you can't get here from there unless you're going through a portal. And when you start talking, I got Ron Pendolfi on camera. He was really upset. He was on a cruise and he talked about uh, his wife says to him, she says, all right, Ron. OK, so uh, uh, what do you say? He calls him footman. What do you say? He said, people have always wondered. Remember, this is the top guy, I right. think, the top guy in the U.S. government. He said, people have always wondered what it's like to go into the next world. The next time John, and there's this guy, his name is John Sillison, sitting right beside him. Next time John goes to the desert, a number of us in this room will go into the next world and come back again. He said it on camera. He was furious when he heard that I got it off his, I pulled it off his wife's YouTube channel. He said, Cameron's a thief, but it's out there and it's circled. Everybody, all the high level people have got it. And he's on camera saying this in this conversation. And that, if that's true, that you can actually, they have a portal. And I think they may have, they may, I don't think they have anti-gravity technology, any of that kind of stuff. I think that's all illusion stuff. I think they may have portals and I'm giving, I'm giving a lecture in Eureka Springs. I'm going to talk about a portal. I've done a lot of work on portals. I think that may be something that we have that the government actually understands the idea of portals and that they actually have may an operational portal that they can actually operate. And so I remember I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you th- this one. Yeah. I was talking to this Tyler D guy and this Tyler D guy was the, the, the big guy from NASA has all these inventions um, and talks about the gifting field where he's, he takes people, it takes Diane Pasolka and Gary Nolan to this field in New Mexico and they call it the gifting field. And they got this metal and it's got a triangle on it and all sort of stuff. And he, I, I, when I met him in a, in 2013, I was at a cabin in, in Pennsylvania and he came and he, sh- he pulls his cell phone out and he shows me this photograph. And he says, so what do you think of this? And he sees two guys in a painting. These two guys look like they're in their pajamas. They're flying through the sky. He says, what do you think of this? And I go, I don't know. I have no idea. And he said, and then he shows me another one and another one, these balls all going into the middle of this painting. And I said, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what this means, you know? And then he shows me this car up on top of a parkade. And he says, there's a look in the back. He said, there's a postcard. And on the postcard, it, it's a postcard. This guy's writing to his girlfriend he, and she's in France. He's in whatever. And he said, I wish I could travel through time and space to be with you. And I said, that's what it said. And he said, yeah. And he said, you know where this is? I said, no, I don't know where it is. And he said, it's the Hughes aircraft building in LA. I go, I still don't know what you're talking about. He said, that's where the jump room is. I said, what? what? Let me see those photographs again. And he starts showing. And remember, this is the top NASA guy. And he showed, yeah. he showed me these photographs. And I said, well, I'm going to go and photograph this when I get there. He said, well, watch out for the guard. And then it's years later. And he said, you know where the, the one with the two guys with the pajamas, you know where that is? And I said, no. He said, it's right outside the elevator. And then I'm, years later, I didn't cue on to me for years later. Suddenly I said, 
So why did he show me that? Why did he have the photographs? Why did he go to the building? Why did he show me these photographs? And, 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 and the thing is, I thought that was total nonsense. This idea of the jump room or the people are, are going, you know, using portal thing to go jump rooms. I'm going, maybe that's true. Why would he show me these photographs? Why would he do this? And why would he have the photographs? Why would he go to the building? So I, the more I look at it, the more I say that almost every time I go through the portal thing, and there's a lot of it leads for the portals. You, you, every you time just, I go, you just made me think of Andrew Basago. Well, that's the story. And that's the thing. That was the thing. It was, so I actually contacted Andy Bishago and I said, were you in the front building or the back building? Because the building is 999 Sepulveda Avenue in LA. <laughs> and I said, were you in the back building or the front building? He said, I don't remember. I was a young kid. So I'm trying to find out, you know, which elevator was it the right building, the right elevator, because they turned it into an office building. It used to be the Hughes Aircraft Building. All the, all the aircraft, all the aircraft designers were on that, on that street. And so that's the thing is every time I go to a portal story, there almost seems to be a, a truth at the end. There seems to be something to it that makes me believe, yeah, they may have this. Every time I go after the anti-gravity stuff, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that, that shows. And I'll give you an example. Uh, if you've followed Joe Firmage, Joe Firmage spent millions. He had this being that came into his room in the 1990s and it gave him this sort of invention. He has these, these gyros that are going the opposite, whatever. Uh -huh. He spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on this gyro thing. And Ron was involved in this thing and they're doing these tests and the guy that owns Skinwalker ran was involved now and stuff like that he could not levitate this thing an inch off the table and then i say if he could not all the money he had all the connections he had to intelligence and the military he could not levitate this thing off a table there's no way we have anti-gravity technology no way but when you look at the portal stuff every time you look at the portal stuff th there seems to be something to it the idea that we may have an operational portal and that we understand that this thing is not physical they're popping in and they're popping out of here that's what kit green says in the in the book we're trying to figure out how do they pop in and pop out not just it's from in one place from one place to another but from one time to another right they're traveling yeah. through time or, or if there's no time and space they're just moving we're all in the same space they're just vibrating at a different level than we are and they come into our environment they can't take on the physical body they can take on a physical craft and they can drop the physical crafts and leave them here and and this kind of stuff and that's the bizarre part even uh if you take a look that's what um uh, tyler d said and remember this is the top nasa guy he was using the word gifting field that this crash was a gifting field that it, it crashed on purpose and then if you listen to the latest interview that was done with bob bigelow who ran the the atip program and he's being interviewed by george knapp george knapp says talks about roswell he said yeah well roswell yeah but there was one in china there was one in russia there was one in south america i think they're seeding them it's the same idea they're dropping it's the theory of wow they're dropping it and that's why the, if you see the wilson leak document at the end of the document say people say oh it's, it's fake document because look they say we've got this this craft and we can't operate it that's exactly what eric davis said they shut the program down in 1989 because they could not figure it out so the the wilson leak document says they have an intact craft that they think they can fly what does that mean? It means they've got an intact craft that they cannot fly because you need a consciousness interlink to turn the thing on. So they've got the craft and they can't move the craft. They can't do anything with the craft. They, and that's the thing. It's been dropped. All this material has been dropped to make us go, what is going on? There's something out there. And all these high level guys are trying to figure it out. And I think everybody's going to go the way of Jacques Vallée and the consciousness thing. It's going to pick up speed. Uh, Leslie Kane is now on board. Leslie Kane would say now consciousness is primary. And that's where we're making the mistake. We've got to get to that point of understanding consciousness and how it fits in. And then we'll start to, as long as we believe it's nuts and bolts and that we can, we can back engineer this or we can levitate a piece of metal or, or, or something like that with terahertz energy and stuff like that, we are going in the wrong direction because it's not that. It's way more more uh, consciousness driven than nuts and bolts. Grant, thank you so much for being with me here tonight. I really appreciate you being here. I hope you get a chance to come back and talk to me again. You're fascinating. And I think this is where things are going. I, I, I can, I can see this myself. That's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on tonight. I really appreciate Beautiful. you being here. I, I, I appreciate you're on the, on the same uh, frequency. I think, uh, um, the more, the more we go along, I think the closer we're getting closer to the answers. I think, uh, I'm pretty optimistic in terms of the stuff I see. I mean, there's some people who are still, you know, doing the, I, I always, I, if you saw one of the videos I posted, I show the, uh, the, the, the cats, have you seen the one with the cats where 
you talked about this thing of measuring stuff where, where the cat, it's like the cat with the laser and the cats are chasing the laser around and the, the guy goes in and do an investigation. Oh, Mr. Cat, okay. Uh, what, what's the, what would you see? Oh, I saw this light. Oh, okay, where was it? Oh, I was measure the distance. <laughs> and we're doing this kind of, that's, I think, but we've gone beyond that. I think there's a lot of people who have figured out and definitely the intelligence people have sort of figured out this, this thing of consciousness that there's this connection. So I, I'm pretty optimistic and whatever happens, uh, it's, it's a matter of what you and I learn for our personal experience in terms of uh, too much is given much is expected. And uh, if you've got information shared and that's where it's at for me. Well, thank you once again, yep. Grant, I really appreciate it. And folks, I'll be back in just a few minutes with some afterthoughts. You are not alone. Thousands of people all over the world have sightings of UFOs per month. MUFON is the place to report them. Since 1969, MUFON has been investigating UFO reports and providing this information to the public. Our aim is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. Support UFO research. Join MUFON today. You are listening to the official podcast of the Mutual UFO Network. All points in time and space are connected. Consciousness underlies reality. These are themes that have continued to manifest themselves relative not only to the UFO phenomenon, but to paranormal matters generally. Rather than ignore or dismiss these phenomena, we must take them into consideration and incorporate them into any models we might make of the universe. Recently, in the MIT Press Reader, Dr. Christoph Koch, the chief scientist of both the MindScope program at the Allen Institute for Brain Science and the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation, has proposed that consciousness exists in all living things. More succinctly, consciousness is experience itself, Consciousness is any experience experienced by any living thing, no matter how minute. This leaves open the possibility that we may actually be able to give rise to living, conscious machines. A physicist named Hong Quinn, who works at the U.S. Department of Energy's Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, has just developed a computer algorithm to predict planetary orbits in the solar system. He instilled the data of the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Ceres, and Jupiter into the algorithm. From the data it was given, the algorithm was able to correctly predict other planetary orbits in the solar system, including parabolic and hyperbolic orbits. Most surprisingly, however, the algorithm never learned Newton's laws of motion or universal gravity. The algorithm was not trained in the laws of physics. The implication of this is that it gives rise to the possibility that the universe itself could be the product of a simple, elegant algorithm. According to Quinn, such an algorithm, if it exists, would have to be simply defined in a discrete space-time network. The complexity and richness of the universe depends on the enormous amount of memory and the power of the processor of the computer, but the algorithm itself could be simple. Is it possible that the UFO phenomenon is not what we think it is at all? Is it possible that we might, as Grant proposes, be etheric beings, temporarily inhabiting corporeal forms? Is it possible that our evolution is being directed by a higher intelligence, persistently calling us throughout time to think in new and different ways? My thanks to Grant Cameron for being with us here tonight and requiring us to stretch our brains a bit. And thank you for joining us here once again. If you are watching us on YouTube, please remember to like and subscribe. We'll see you next time right here on the official MUFON podcast.